host a few of these events, but I'm the director of education with the ISA. I created uh, coursework through The Craft Course. Uh, you can go to thecraftcourse.com if you're interested. Um, it's a 12 week course, self-guided uh, audio video. You can go as quickly or as slowly as you like. Once you purchase it, you have it forever. Um, I'm also a consultant with my company called The Story Farm. And The Story Farm I, is really just me. I'm working one-on-one -on -one with a bunch of writers on either a weekly basis or monthly basis, um, developing material, working through the creative brainstorming, but also with an educational approach. So I've worked with writers who have never written a screenplay before, all the way up to A-list actors and writers. So if you're interested, you can email me at that same email address of max at storyfarm.org. I also have a writing group through the Storing Farm, two of them, Thursday evenings, Friday mornings. Um, and it's not a workshop, it's just kind of a little kind of community-based sort of thing on Zoom. We share ideas every now and then, log lines and brainstorms. Um, <clears throat> actually, I went through the presentation I'm gonna to give today with my Friday morning group as a little bit of a practice, but um, week three of the craft course, highly recommended. It's great, thanks, Darren. Um, for those who haven't worked with Max, he's fantastic. You'll learn, hey, wow, let's just keep making comments about how awesome I am. <laughs> I'm not that awesome, but thank you guys. Yeah, so today I have a ton of information and I'm gonna dump on all of you in a relatively short amount of time. I can only go about an hour. I'm gonna to try to answer as many questions as you have, and I'm sure you're gonna have a lot. Um, but we're getting really specific, you know, a lot of times with the events that I host, I do host a monthly class slash webinar where I focus on one particular topic. Um, can you join the Thursday evening uh, or Friday morning? Yes, you can join. I still have room. You can email me at max at the story farm.org just to inquire. And I can give you information. It's 50 bucks a month. You get three meetings a month. Um, and you can cancel any time. You don't have to stay in for any length of the time, but um, I do have some, some spots left, yeah. It's a really fun, interactive, easygoing, supportive group. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> today I'm gonna be really specific to developing a TV show and by breaking down Ted Lasso. And I think the important caveat here is that even if you're a feature writer, you're still going to be using, able to use a lot of what I talk about in terms of the development process for your own project. It just, TV is a whole different animal and there's more upfront work that you're going to need to do to break the whole show. And by break, I mean, you see everything. And it's why they have TV writing rooms, you know, rooms of a lot of writers <laughs> working on a TV show because there are so many different elements relationships, storylines, situations that need to be worked out before you ever get to the page. So that's what we're going to talk about, specifically half-hour comedy. And um, <clears throat> Bella is not finding this very funny. But um, so we're going to specifically talk about developing half-hour comedy, but I'm going to try to every now and then, you know, reference why this can work for hour-long TV um, and even the feature approach. Darren was mentioning week three of the craft course. Thank you for a little bit of a segue there, Darren. I'm not going to be talking all that much about the sequences. I teach a 12 sequence approach to story. Um, it fits a little bit better with the feature world and, and screenplays because you've got three sequences in the first act, six in the second, three in the third act. Each sequence is roughly eight to 10 pages long. It's not as formulaic as I'm making it sound, but it is a little bit of a formula. Um, I'm not going to dive into that all that much because it's, it's tricky to get into the process of sequencing, which is multiple scenes. It's not just one sequence of a, of a scene um, for half hour comedy, because it's such a scrunched, you know, trimmed amount of time. You only have half hour. Um, so the sequences don't exactly equate perfectly. The beats are still there. What I'm going to focus more on is concept and character with a little reference to structure. And that's the overall approach that I have for developing a project is going from the top down concept to character, to structure, to page work, with a focus on those elements at the top first and before you get to page work. It, too often I see writers go, here's my concept and premise, let's get to the pages. And you're missing that middle chunk that is so absolutely important. And you have to be breaking down all of your character work, all of the relationships, all the various storylines that could happen. And that's even before structuring it meaning here's where the scenes happen, here's where the act breaks are. How do you know what those scenes are and what the act breaks are going to be if you don't know what the storylines and characters are based on the overall concept and premise? 
because the concept and premise then works back down as far as allowing you to develop scenes and moments that could then exist in the storylines, exist in the relationship, you know, evolutions that then <clears throat> you can make a decision on as far as structural beats. We can't hear the cat, so no. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. <laughs> I sure can. So I'm going to try to act as though it's not bothering me. Um, but thank you for the comment, Gary. I guess my microphone has a nice specific um, direction to it. All right, I think we've got a full house here, um, which is great. And just as a reminder, this is being recording recorded. If you have to ditch out early, totally fine. It's going to end up on the pro tips page, probably within a few days. But um, all right, let's just jump into it. So I'm going to give a little bit of a lecture and then I'll share my screen and I'll go through a little PowerPoint presentation. But um, I am purposely covering up the comments. Uh, section of the Zoom page I'm looking at. If you have questions at any time, throw it into the Q&A portion of the, of the screen below, put it there, and that way it organizes me to be able to go through it. If you have comments, please feel free to put it in the comment section. You can all talk amongst yourselves as I'm going through this. It's going to be a lot of talking. It's going to be a lot of information. I get it if all of this is like, oh my God, what he's, <laughs> this is, you know, brain overload. I get that um, because in a way developing TV is a brain overload, but I think this is all important to see at first, just so you can kind of, oh, I see vocabulary terms. Here's how I can organize things so that then you can apply it to your own project. This, you know, breaking down Ted Lasso does not necessarily, and what you'll see anyway, does not necessarily mean here's how I can break my show exactly the same way in terms of a structural approach, blah, blah, blah because the formula doesn't always fit perfectly. Usually you have five scenes per act in a half hour comedy, you know, that's fine. You can go from that basic mathematical formula, but you know, some shows have a teaser uh, that's a half a page or two pages or three pages. Some shows have a little end runner, like a sitcom. You might come back after the, it, every show is different. What I'm using as an example is a non-network streamer half hour comedy which is different than the traditional sitcom like a mom or friends or big bang theory. It is different. Nonetheless, there are still act breaks. Let's, you know, I'm not going to focus all that much on structure, even though it's all connected, we'll get there. <clears throat> so to start in a half hour comedy, a pilot specifically, you can't spend too much time without presenting the central conflict of the pilot. We just don't have the paid space or screen time to focus only on character like you can in a feature. You can have, you know, eight, 10 minutes of the first you know, order of your uh, feature where it's really just character stuff. There might be some light plot thrown in, but in a half hour comedy, plot needs to be introduced as quickly as possible just for basic page space, you know, screen time. Um, and if not immediately, like it is in Ted Lasso and even like an hour long, like a Stranger Things. It's of course necessary to present who the characters are early on. We have to present a concrete pursuit oriented goal that has a dilemma built in or kind of the reverse, an overarching plot dilemma and situation that then brings in a character with the goal like Ted Lasso does. And you have, if you haven't seen Ted Lasso, I'm gonna be giving away a whole bunch of spoilers, <laughs> but <clears throat> you, should, you should see it. It's on Apple TV plus, it's amazing. Probably one of the best half hour comedies that's been out in a long time. In other words, each storyline in a TV series has a presented situation. And the word situation really inherently provides conflict, just that word, because someone, a character, is presented to the audience with an intent and a goal, and then they move toward accomplishing that goal. Or another word for that is pursuit. And of course, showing the nature along that pursuit of how challenging it's gonna be based on the overall plot situation at hand, the conceptual hook. All of that that I just said is done in the first six minutes of Ted Lasso. Love it, it's amazing. But virtually every half hour comedy does that within the first five, six minutes. Um, so thinking about an arc of an episode, you wanna think of TV or an episode of TV as simply as you possibly can when you're just trying to break down another show and really even your own. What it is in a very basic sense is that you meet a character and you see who they are in terms of their personality. We then understand what they want and why it's important to pursue it. Sometimes the plot and or emotional stakes are presented a little bit later, like in Ted Lasso, but not much later, it's there. We're then presented with the dilemma of their situation, that it's gonna be a challenge to, 
pursue their goal of the episode and then why it's going to be a challenge. We then see them going through these challenges due to these plot-based problems and their own emotional problems. It's combined, plot and character. The episode then culminates in a serialized show, especially, in the problem not quite being solved by the end, but instead slightly compounding on itself. Again, this is a serialized show. It's going to be more difficult going forward, but you know they're rooted in their determination to make this thing happen, achieve their goal, solve their problem. That's the very basic general approach to any episode of TV. Now, from a structural standpoint, I said I wasn't going to cover the structure that much, but from a structural standpoint, it is important to note that we want a big and complicating end of, to the acts, each act. So each act should hopefully end with some kind of a twist, complication, a bigger problem, a surprise, an existing problem becoming bigger, et cetera, et cetera. We just need to keep the audience on its toes, regardless, you know, expecting something, excited, intrigued by something. And we need to do this at least, and really at the most, every 10 minutes, probably a little less in a half hour comedy. Yeah, in a half hour. Hour long, you're gonna have five acts. Half hour, you're probably gonna have a three act structure. Again, it kind of depends on teaser or runner, but nonetheless, it's roughly a three act structure. So with every storyline and situation, which are basically the same thing, we have to consider what the character wants, how and why they're pursuing what they want and what the stakes are or what would happen if they don't succeed. So with Ted Lasso, you have an overall plot situation <clears throat> of an American football coach moving to London to coach an English Premier League football team without knowing anything about the, the sport. That conflict is the central conflict to the whole series. And then it's laced through virtually every single scene going forward, especially in the pilot. As episodes go on, we focus a little bit more on character storylines, evolving relationships, but that's because why? Because we can only rely on the plot problem and the central conflict for so long in terms of in, you know, generating entertainment. Because after a while, the audience just kind of gets it. They're like, fine, this is the plot situation. <laughs> I get it. We don't need to constantly see him not knowing how to coach soccer. You know, like it's, it, it's going to get repetitive. So how do you evolve that central conflict? It's through the characters and their evolving relationships based on pursuit, goals, the inherent dilemma within their own personal situation and ultimately what they want and why. So that, of course, then helps define the stakes for them personally. So what do we end up seeing at the act breaks because of this kind of combination of plot and character? It's the so-called plot twist. You know, we hear that term constantly, plot twist. But the plot gets twisted because of the emotional elements at play within their own character storylines. But the plot is still involved. And that's the, the difficulty, but also genius of half hour comedy. It's the perfect marriage of plot and character. So, and I'll get into all that. But the point of reason I'm kind of starting with this little kind of lecture summary is that we, it has to be made clear to all of you watching, all of that work, what I just said, needs to be figured out, mapped out, developed long before you ever write a page of the script. So let's take a look at Ted Lasso. I'm gonna share my screen if I can bring up my little presentation. And of course, poor Bella is smushing up against my leg because she's really freaking out. <laughs> Hopefully she'll calm down here. I feel bad, but um, all right, let's share the screen. Um, it is such a great show, Molly. It's so great. How can one join one of the writing groups? Uh, just email me, max at the storyfarm.org um, and just inquire about it. You know, just ask, how do I join a writing group? And I'll give you all the details and how it works and the schedule and all that stuff. Uh, Bradley says, I've I'd never seen Ted Lasso, so I binge watched the series last night to prep for the class. So that's great. It, it, pretty easy show to binge watch. It's so great. It's so good. It's so good. Um, okay, cool. And this really, you know, it goes for non-sports fans. Like if you're not, if you don't like sports, it doesn't, whatever. Like it, it, the situation is so interesting and fun because of Ted. Ted, Ted is just a fabulous character. And that's one point I want to make. You know, you notice the name of the show is Ted Lasso. It's him. <laughs> it's his name. And you'll see that <clears throat> in a lot of movies or shows 
where it's named after the main character. And it's usually because he is the most unique element of the story or she or whoever the character is. Uh, a Shrek, you know, it's, the title of the movie is his name because we hadn't really seen that type of character before. Um, the interesting part about Ted Lasso in and of himself is that we've seen an optimistic character before. You know, like, it's not like that's brand new. We've seen a football coach before. But when you add all the elements together, where he's just eternally optimistic and excessively hopeful, like it's, it's to a point of being noxious um, and being kind of from a Southern state with a little bit of an accent um, set within this situation of him having to coach this English Premier League football team. Now you've got a unique character, you know? So when considering character development and making this person as unique as possible, it's not always just the character because we've seen pretty much everyone before and we've seen just about every story before. Once you start combining elements, then you start to see you know, the uniqueness come out. <clears throat> Lauren says, I didn't watch it for ages as I'm not a football fan, right? Exactly. When I finally did, by the end of it, I was cheering for Richmond to win. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of fun. Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. Let's get on with this. I'm going to probably go through this pretty fast, everybody, so I apologize. Um, but I'm going to do it um, to hopefully placate the just horrified cat in the other room. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of a front end kind of summary of logline work, conceptual work, and eventually we'll make our way into how the actual pilot episode of Ted Lasso is broken down. But I'm being a little cheeky here with the logline or with the uh, reference to the log line, because I'm saying if you have any intention of getting represented or being noticed, the log line is extremely important, but then I'm going to hopefully try and change your minds about the purpose of a log line, because I then say a log line has nothing to do with selling or marketing. I'm, it's obviously, <laughs> I'm being hypocritical um, and it's an exaggeration. Of course, it has a lot to do with selling or marketing. I'm just trying to flip the script so-called on how we can look at a log line. Because I, what I want you to focus on is that a log line has everything to do with you and your development of the project. So your log line can and should be used as a means to help you create your show. Use it as a means to brainstorm, develop, most importantly, define the premise. That's a huge focus that we're gonna be going on through and, and spending time on today. You need to know what that recurring moment is for your series before you ever write one page of the script. You have to know what that is. You have to define it. So let's look at what should be presented in a log line, not just so you write a solid log line, but just so you see the whole show overall. Um, I'm gonna share the, to a full screen mode here. It's probably gonna be a little more professional. <laughs> I just realized, uh, enter full screen. Okay, there we go. Uh, these four elements, <clears throat> primary elements in a log line, really in a story, but the log line presents these four. Establishes a character with a problem, it proves genre. How do you do that? It's through word choice. If it's a comedy, use some funny words. It shows the unique hook. It provides the situational recurring moment. So for TV writers, log lines are not just for feature writers. I know that seems like duh, but you technically have more uh, work to do. It's important because you need to not only sell the idea behind the pilot, but you also have to do so for the first season and the full series. So at the very least, when creating a series pitch deck, I'm not gonna go too much into pitch decks today, guys, but when you do, <laughs> you'll need those three log lines at the very beginning of your pitch document. Pilot, first season, full series. Um, yes, because you want the people reading the document to understand here's the whole thing, but it also helps you to see what's coming beyond just the pilot episode. So I'm placing that emphasis on you, you know, not just the executive or the producer. It's not just a marketing tool. A well-developed log line is gonna, will prove that you've not only one episode figured out, but an entire series. And it's the series as a whole that an executive or producer is gonna purchase, not just the pilot. So in order to prove the viability of your TV series, you must understand and establish what your recurring moment is. I'm gonna be using that term a lot. And that's really just another term for hook. These four primary elements to any story, these are, there are, <laughs> I've done this a little too much in, in my practice, but flawed hero, secondary helper, second act obstacle, villain threat opponent. So the second act obstacle, these sound really specific. A second act obstacle is just another reference to the recurring moment. It's the moment we're gonna see over and over again in the middle of your story. Obviously in a half hour comedy, you do have a second act. It's the middle of the episode. In a half hour, or I'm sorry, in an hour long, the middle of your story is really acts two, three, four, 
you know, you've got an act one, act five, kind of beginning and end, and then the middle acts, of course, in a feature, it's your second act. So <clears throat> these four elements need to be in every story, but also presented in your log line. It's more important though, to address what all four of these elements create. And like I said, it's the hook or what I call the recurring moment. So we've all heard that term before. It's rare though, to really be able to see it. And that's why what I'm referencing at the bottom of the page is I'm calling it that so that we can see this is what hook means. It's, it's through moments, you know, it's a type of moment that will happen again and again and the half hour comedy that's so important. Here's an example of a log line that not only shows all the four story elements, but as a whole proves the story's hook. So here's a log line for Ted Lasso. I wrote this myself. It's not perfect. Um, but in the middle of a failing marriage, an American college football coach is hired to coach an English Premier League football team despite having no experience in the sport, but his excessive optimism and eternal hope drives the team to band together in spite of the team's owner purposely attempting to sabotage the entire franchise. So in a way I'm using kind of the secondary character so-called <clears throat> as the whole team, um, not just singling out one person necessarily, um, but of course we're focusing on um, our main character and his flaws. We're referencing his excessive optimism and eternal hope. Um, and of course the opponent and what that opponent's motive is, what she's doing. So obviously it's for Ted Lasso, it's not perfect, but the situation, <clears throat> the overall premise, the hook, recurring moment, there are multiple terms for this, that situation of Ted coaching in a sport he knows nothing about. This is entertaining enough to see and experience over and over again. It's enough to at least carry the very basic conflict of the story. It's not, though, enough to fully develop a story or present a fully developed story because that moment needs the rest of those story elements to enhance it and make it emotionally important. So more specifically, it needs relationships. It needs the team banding together. It needs the failing marriage. It needs the plan sabotaged by the team owner in order for it to be a fully developed concept. So it's necessary to present logline, you know, the, with the flaw of the hero. In this case, like I said, opt excessively optimistic, eternally hopeful. Um, it's essential because we understand how the character will be acting within the presented situation. That's so important. I'm pausing for effect. <laughs> that then, of course, is going to be an essential part of the recurring moment. It's not just that this coach has never coached soccer. It's the fact that he's excessively optimistic and eternally hopeful. That helps define the type of moment we're going to be seeing. And like I say at the bottom, it's critical to your brainstorming and development because that's going to allow you to see the moments and scenes that are going to come up. Two possible examples of what can create a hook and recurring moment. This is just for brainstorming purposes for any type of show. A normal character forced into an extraordinary situation, an extraordinary character dealing with normal situations. So what those statements naturally do is create this unique situation. Like I was saying at, at the upfront, a unique character in a unique situation may be, but usually a unique character helps create the unique situation. Like I was saying about the, all the com combined elements of Ted Lasso. Um, <clears throat> what did I say? Yeah, usually an extraordinary character dealing with something normal, boring every day. That's a little bit more interesting than just like some super soldier fighting in a super war. We, we see that though, in all the super uh, uh, superhero movies. And so I'm not saying you can't have a super soldier fighting in a super war, but <clears throat> the point here is you want to focus on the moment that occurs over and over again in the middle of your script. The second act of a feature, middle acts of your pilot. Uh, let me see what we have for comments if anybody's leaving anything in case I'm missing something. Um, okay, what was the third and fourth in the list of logline components? Okay, I'll go back and show that really quick. Um, logline components. Here we go. Establishes the character of the problem, proves genre, shows the unique hook, provides the situational recurring moment. Provides and, and then that's really kind of everything that I'm explaining here. You have a situational recurring moment because you have Ted, who is who he is, you know, personality flaws, et cetera, within the overall premise of the show. Football coach from America, having to coach soccer, never done it before. Now, you, with, because of who, who Ted is, that's now creating the recurring moment. Talk about that. Um, I have a, a YA project that I'm shopping around as an animated uh, show called The Wish Keeper. And so the recurring moment for that, this is just an example, a rebellious teenage fairy with a disability hell bent on finding a true love wish to prove herself worthy. 
while managing the heartbreak of reconciling with their parents. That's the type of moment we're going to see over and over again. It isn't quite a log line. It says, you know, I'm saying at the bottom, do you notice what that statement resembles a log line? It's close to a log line. It's not quite a log line yet, though, because I don't really have relationship reference. It's not showing a structural order of when this happens with this character and another character through this adventure journey and obstacles and, you know, until this kind of wild complication happens. You're going to further develop this to really become a log line, but you have to be able to define what that recurring moment is. Even more important, so there'll be a recurring moment in your pilot episode. It's the weekly situation. But there's also an overarching situation in the first season in the series in general. So in Ted Lasso, it's easy to see overall first season situation. Ted needs to assimilate as the head coach within a sport that's completely foreign to him. And of course, live in a foreign land, <laughs> even though London isn't that foreign, but you know, it's different than Kansas. So we'll see that kind of moment in every single episode. And, and it's going to evolve throughout the series per episode is then taking a magnifying glass to the overall situation, focusing in on a situation within the overall situation. So I don't know how many times I can use the word situation. <laughs> but episode one shows Ted being introduced to the head coach position, the sport for the very first time, meeting his new players, team owner. More critically, this really the big focus of the episode is this you know press conference he goes through and it's a disaster. Um, so he's being introduced to this whole new world. The following episode, and episodes plural, still presents Ted within this new world, but the storyline is then, the overall storyline is honing in on the specific relationships that he's a part of, that he's gonna be managing, you know, all of course with the intent to make a good impression. So the point of all this, and I'll simplify, you have to define your serious situation upfront, right away. What's the type of situation the audience is always gonna experience every episode? Then each episode defines one or two specific stories, maybe three or four, that then contain that DNA of the overall situation. So you're then looking at the relationships and how they're kind of a part of the overall premise. If the specific storylines are serialized, like it is in Ted Lasso, then there isn't a wrap up of the storyline in each episode. There may be in some episodes, but not every episode. They're gonna continue throughout the season. If each storyline does resolve itself by the end of the episode, then you have a true sitcom, like a Friends, a Mom, a Big Bang Theory. And then the work you're gonna to have to do is brainstorming entirely new little stories for every single episode. Friends eventually became a little serialized. You know, you had the evolution of Ross and Rachel and Chandler and Monica, but it was much more situationally based per episode. They had little storylines every episode. So when I use that term recurring moment, I'm not just referring to exactly one moment. You know, it's it's a type of moment that audiences can and should expect to experience every episode. But this isn't just for the audience. It's for you to brainstorm from it. If you understand what, here's my general recurring moment that I think I'm gonna be seeing based on the premise of the whole show, you can go to scene brainstorms, moment brainstorms, types of things that might happen. You know, like with Ted, one of the type of moment brainstorms is him sitting down in his little flat and he opens up a box of shredded wheat. And this happens not like episode three or something. Um, and a, a full block of shredded wheat <laughs> falls into his bowl. It's because that's how it's made there. In America, we have these tiny little mini frosted bites and they're, you know, it's a tiny little bites of cereal. And so just a moment like that is a part of the overall recurring moment type. Yes, it isn't necessarily directly related to football or soccer, whatever you call it. Um, but it is related to him being basically a fish out of water. So you can have a list of those types of moments. Just list them. Who cares if you use them or not? That's what the writer's room is doing. How many different things we come up with that's going to show him being a fish out of water? So audience expectation is a, is a big term to remember because that defines the recurring moment because it defines the overall concept and premise. But it's it's also like I'm saying, it's then defined by the individual character storylines that live within the overall premise. But what I'm really saying there to simplify in terms of audience expectation is the audience literally expects to see those types of moments when they tune in. Is that it's, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be condescending, but we all already know this. <laughs> you know, we watch TV all the time. When I sit down to watch, you know, Shadow and Bone on Netflix, 
I expect to see this weird black wall and this young girl who doesn't understand her powers and people trying to take advantage of those, you know, powers from a political stand. You know, I, my, my brain is always already expecting things. So we have to deliver on those expectations, but in a way that we, we, the audience wouldn't expect. And that obviously is the hard part. But that's why all this front end work needs to be done. So just as an example, the primary difference between a movie and a TV series where emotional flaw is concerned, or at least character development is concerned. For a movie, the flaw or the character is flawed in order to allow for a journey that puts the character into situations that will correct the flaw. The point is for the character to evolve, and I'm generalizing. <laughs> but TV, the character is flawed in order to allow an ongoing set of circumstances to be made more interesting, entertaining, and dramatic. So the point is for the situation to evolve. Ted's gonna be Ted. He's going to, he has an anxiety attack about halfway through the episode and he's dealing with this failing marriage. And those, you know, sp that specific storyline is evolving him, but he's not gonna, like if he starts off eternally optimistic, excessively hopeful, by the end of the series, he's not gonna be a villain <laughs> you know he's not going to be hopeless and pessimistic that's not the point of a tv series in again general a general sense even in breaking bad it took five seasons or however many seasons or what eight seasons um for walt to ultimately break bad he it was the process of seeing him breaking bad but it was a slow evolution all based on the overall plot situation of him as a science teacher making math to make money but what happened with Walt, and even though I'm going off on a tangent, I'm supposed to be talking about Ted Lasso, uh, Walt up front is presented as someone who loses control completely, right? He's diagnosed with a terminal disease. So he tries to do everything he can to grip control by uh, providing for his family, creating this so-called career um but then that control is what gets out of control right he falls in love with having more and more and more control so it's a little bit of a i don't know if reverse evolution is the right way of saying it but we see him over a long period of time evolve evolve is a better choice of words than change you know in a movie especially like a pixar movie you're going to see marlin and finding nemo um unable to let go, terrified to, you know, set his son free. In the end, he's the exact opposite. You know, some movies are that way. Other movies are like a Forrest Gump, where Forrest doesn't really change at all, but everyone around him changes. And so it's, it's this is all relative. And I just, I'm, I'm admitting that this is, you know, generalizing here, but <clears throat> primary difference is plot versus character. So the irony is that it would seem a movie would focus more on character than a TV series would, which it technically does. But what's been happening in TV recently, there's a heavy focus on character development. TV now sends the audience on this experience of seeing a character evolve and change over a very long period of time, as opposed to, and even though they do do this sometimes, but as opposed to tuning in every week to see the same exact character not evolve, but instead experience different situations. That, I, that's just really reference to what more audiences are, are wanting now, you know, even though the NCISs and 911s and the medical shows and those are always going to be popular <clears throat> but there's just that much more focus on long-term character development and the best shows do this perfectly in terms of blending plot and character so let's dive in finally <laughs> to ted lasso so define your storylines and there's some vocabulary terms that i just want to hit up front here so you kind of understand what i'm talking about so Let's try not to think of the term only as A story, B story, C story, even though we hear those terms all the time. It's, it's what the industry calls it, and it's fine. But we don't need to call it that when developing our project. Let's just remember that you know all of this that I'm presenting to you is for the development of your project, not presentation of. So uh, obviously, it's important to be able to determine, here's my A story um, as it's you know developed. But when just beginning the process of development, let's not worry about these vocabulary terms as you know rules for development purposes consider calling them situation a situation b situation c and it's mainly because tv is based in much more of a situational approach than movies and the number of situations that recur during a series is what creates this layered story in general and however you want to term term all of these call whatever you want to call it <laughs> the point is to give your characters room to play 
through multiple storylines, multiple situations. Characters that have flaws that are that will define them as unique, but not necessarily flaws that will change. All right. Does the character need to change? This is a question I get all the time. Loaded question in a little bit of a way, but the immediate answer is no. Your character doesn't need to change, but the better question is what's the format of your show within which your character will evolve or not evolve? So, you know, kind of like what I was saying about uh, Friends, even though all TV series are based on a unique situation, not all of them are specific to an evolving dramatic moment. It's another reference to recurring moment. Friends didn't have a specific dramatic moment until relatively later. I mean, they started with the Ross and Rachel thing, but it was still heavily situationally based per episode. They slowly evolved that storyline. Um, they didn't change their, you know, their flaws. They stayed the same. Ross was still Ross by the end. Rachel was still, you know, it was more about the situations they experienced. So the situation within which the characters lived and experienced stayed the same for the entire series. And so, you know, they still experienced dating, employment, parents, children living in a big city. Those are technically all individual situations that episode storylines can be based on. But they also merely create an overall situation of having close friends, lifelong friends, um, mundane yet difficult experiences of life together. You know, it's, I don't know if anybody saw the Friends um, reunion, but one of the creators said that it's, you know, it's a show about when your friends are your family or that time in life when your friends are your family. And it's that situation we see every episode. It's just changed up with little situations and storylines. Here's where things get kind of like, brain heavy. <laughs> Here's where I start to break down the show, right? Breaking apart your series so you divide the plot and the characters. It's going to help you in the early development of your project. All of these situations help you create moments on screen based on individual storylines. So here's where I really started to break it down. I saw that there were really three primary plot situations. Plot situation A, B, and C. A being the obvious one. An American college football coach is hired to manage an English Premier League football team right? B, the new team owner is secretly trying to sabotage and destroy the football team. C, the two-star players battle for dominance, new school versus old school. C is arguable, but it is a situation that happens quite a bit from a plot level, and it creates character storylines. That's really the whole point of a plot situation. It allows for the character situations to live. We have a lot more character situations just because we have a lot of characters. We have Ted, Rebecca, Roy, Jamie, Keeley, and Nate. I'm combining character situations ENF purely for reasons of I just didn't have enough room on this page. <laughs> I would have individualized them. Um, some questions that have come up. Does character situation A mean it's more important than character situation B? And no. Really what this is doing is providing basic amount of screen time. We're going to see Ted more often than we're going to see Rebecca. We're going to see Rebecca more often than Roy, so on and so forth. Like it's just basic percentage of, of how often we're referencing these storylines. The irony with Ted Lasso is that they're all pretty equal. Ted's the obvious one that we see more of. Um, but they're all, it's, it's, it's ironic that the show's called Ted Lasso because it is quite a bit, a, a bit of an ensemble. Keely is a really important character. Jamie and Roy are essential. Like they spend a decent amount of time on those individual storylines. But why I did it this way is to just to kind of divide the development process for you. When you're going through the, the breaking of your series, just you have to be able to define, here's, my, here's one plot situation, here's the second one, here's the third, and then here are all the characters and the situations they're in personally. That's the biggest difference between these two words, plot and character. Emotion, right? Em there's a, an emotional intent and problem that they're dealing with. So we've got Ted, fish out of water, manages for while battling anxiety over his failing marriage. That's not really plot. You know, that's an emotional issue he's going to be dealing with. Rebecca fights back. There's an active word choice there. You know, he fights back against her selfish ex-husband by sabotaging the team he loved while battling her fear of loneliness. That's a theme in her story that continues to come up. And what do we see throughout the first season is Rebecca makes friends with people that she'd never expected to make friends with. That's part of her evolution. Roy fights against his aging career in retirement while stubbornly rejecting vulnerability and leadership. Jamie is a developing phenom, meaning like a star and knows it, more focused on image and himself, yet battles a need for approval. That's a big part of his process that we don't really find out until the very end of the season, 
um, that there is a huge reason that he's battling approval. And then character situations E and F, Keeley pushes to evolve her career as a model into something more satisfying. Nate battles bullying as the team equipment manager. I could have said a lot more about Nate. He's a huge character in the show. Uh, he's probably my favorite. Um, but in terms of screen time and, and per the storylines, he is kind of in, in line with Keeley. Um, but again, they're all relatively equal if you really should watch the show. Um, I'll get into that. I, my brain almost went to a different topic. I'll get into that in a second. So the reason it's important to divide it up like this is because you can take like one of these situational references. And for your own purposes, you can go much further. Like you can give a lot more than just writing this out. It's nice to be succinct, um, but you can give a lot more in your own process of development. But what this allows, Ted, fish out of water, manages born sport, battling anxiety over his failing marriage. You can then put that like on a separate document and then below it, just brainstorm the hell out of it. How many moments and scenes can I come up with that show these things? I don't even know if I'm going to use the scenes. I don't know if they're any good. I have no idea, you know, where it might land structurally, but you can use each of these to then brainstorm moments and scenes. That's why we organize it this way. I doubt the writers did it in such an organized way like this. They, they probably just knew these things inherently, but there was probably some level of, of just going, all right, plot and character. Let's try to figure all these things out. And that's what breaking the story is in the writer's room and you know, putting things on walls. But you can then move to a structural approach, how the situations play out structurally in the pilot. A lot easier when I just watch the episode and read the script, you know, I can just go here are the scenes, you know, for you, you're gonna have to come up with these scenes. <laughs> but nonetheless, what this does is allows you to organize the acts. I mean, in other words, here's how many scenes the act has. But it also, what is interesting when breaking down an existing show, you see what they're doing. That's why I'm bolding these words. You see the point of the scenes. It's plot first. You know, scene one is we meet Rebecca and Higgins. There's, she fires the coach. Higgins is like, should I put together a list of new coaches? And she's like, no, no need. And we jump to this little news bulletin from ESPN. It's you know, reference to plot situation A. New college football coach, you know, Ted Lasso, he's been named new manager of Greenwich Football. Yeah, it's actually Greenwich Football Club. I think it was Richmond. Um, I think that was in the, the script. Anyway, um, <laughs> plot situation A and character situation A. So scene three introduces us to Ted. It's on a plane. And the reason I'm saying plot situation and character situation is because we're still with an emphasis on plot as we enter the scene but there's also a reference to the overall character emotional situation because of his conversation with Coach Beard. Then scene four, it's still plot first with character situation A, and they're just kind of meandering through London, right? We get a sense of fishes out of water <laughs> because he literally says, boy, we're not in Kansas anymore. You know, there's a comment on that. That ends the act. It brings us into act two, which you'll see without it really even having to read all this, you see character first, and then it's a scene about plot first with character references, and then a scene with character reference first, then plot, and then it's back to plot first and then character. And what this it allows you to do when you're developing your own, your own show is that after doing the work of brainstorming the relationships, possible moments and scenes, how those storylines are going to evolve relationship wise, and of course, plot wise, you can then come up with these this order of things, in other words. But it's, there's emphasis on the point of the scene. That, like, it's kind of going back to what I was saying, that if you spend too much on plot, you're going to lose the audience because there isn't enough, enough character infused here. So it's also then helpful when breaking down an existing show to see how they're ending the acts. You have scene eight, Rebecca admits to Higgins that she hired Ted with the intent to completely ruin the team in order to destroy the only thing her ex-husband ever truly loved. Dun, 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 <laughs> you know, end of act two. Oh, shit. And Higgins is like, oh, boy. And now we've got the primary plot dilemma, the pro problem. But Ted isn't aware. So the next scene in act three is Ted just kind of going with it. You know, we've got plot reference first because he's out on the training field with Coach Beard. They join Nate. They compliment Nate on his Gatorade sports drink making skills. And he feels like, oh, my gosh, I'm kind of I, somebody likes me. That's why we have character situation F. 
And then we have background on the, the two stars, Roy and Jamie. We see their types and personalities. And we keep going with that. It's plot and character and then character first. And then plot and character, plot and character. And then we end on character with, you know, arguably, I didn't necessarily need to add this plot situation reference because it's just kind of assumed. Um, I'll go through these in a second. What's interesting is that if you count the scenes, 13 scenes total. That equates to, if every scene is roughly two pages long, 26 pages. Not every scene is, scene is two pages long. A lot of them are a little bit longer, resulting in probably a 34, 35 page script. Half hour comedy, you're pushing the envelope a little bit in that sense. The pilot that um, was written was actually 40 pages long, but I think there were at least three scenes that were cut out, probably because they just didn't have time to put it all into a half hour. Um, it's also important to note that the people that wrote it were veterans. They've been doing this a long time. Jason Sudeikis obviously has celebrity status. Um, and the two, Roy, uh, I think his name is Brendan, and Coach Beard, uh, I can't remember the actress name, they were both creators also. So there was a little bit of, um, you know, I know I'm going to make the show kind of thing so they can get away with a longer page count. But anyway, you'll note, we've got five scenes referenced in act three, four in act two, for in act one. It just happened to work that way. I don't know if the writers actively made that choice, probably. What's interesting though, is that scene seven is the big press conference where everybody, it just goes horribly. It's a really long scene on the page in the script. It's like six or seven pages. That's probably why act two is technically shorter. It's not actually in reference to the outline because scene seven is quite long. There's a lot of monologuing. There's a you know, whole bunch of things that happen. So it was probably more of like a five scene act two, four scene act three. Um, this is kind of up to you in terms of how you break down your own show. More often than not in a half hour comedy, you're gonna have relatively an equal amount of scenes in each act. And you have to think mathematically. I have maximum of 35 pages, more often than not, in a half hour comedy for an undiscovered writer who hasn't produced anything. You, you wanna keep it pretty tight. Um, and so what does that look like? I have maybe 13, 15 scenes I'm allowed, you know? And some of those scenes can go a little long, maybe have 16, 17 scenes with a couple that are a little short. But we don't wanna worry too much about a perfect formula. There really isn't one. The, the more important reference here is this plot character and then we have character situations because what this is doing is defining how important these scenes are. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's the, again, it's the point of the scene. Here's why this scene exists. I need to get this information out and what Ted Lasso does so well and a lot of half hour comedies do so well is that they combine character personality with the plot information. And that's so critical because you have such a short amount of time in a half hour comedy. You have to be combining plot and character. Every now and then, like in the first act, you'll see it's really just plot. I could have easily referenced here in plot situation A and B, a Re Rebecca character situation, you know, like, oh, because Rebecca's involved. However, there isn't a reference to care, uh, Rebecca's specific emotional problem. There is like a slight reference that, oh, she, you know, her ex-husband, might have had an affair or something, but we're not diving into that all that much. It's more about firing the coach, you know, change, rearranging the office. That's really the point of that scene. What's really interesting is, is the last scene of the pilot where scene 13 here, Ted and Beard say goodnight outside of Ted's new flat. Ted sees just how nice the flat is. He kind of gets acquainted. He, and then he ends the scene. Oop, I have a plural scene. Uh oh, that's a typo. Um, Ends the scene with a phone call to home to his son and wife, which we didn't know he really even had. Like, I think there might've been a reference to his cell phone where there was a picture of somebody on there, but there was no real reference. So the phone call though is kind of brilliant because it's all through the perspective of Ted. So it's showing character, heavy character, in spite of referencing plot at the same time, because we have him telling him or telling her that, you know, everything's going really well. It's kind of difficult to get acquainted. You know, he's kind of rehashing some of that. But the whole point of that scene, and really in order to end the, the show, there is an added little scene at the end where he lays down in bed and he says, oh, now I can't sleep. I didn't include it because it's like, whatever, it's like a quarter of a page. <laughs> but nonetheless, the point of the scene is that he says, I love you to his wife, 
but his wife doesn't not only not reciprocate it, Ted says it's okay if you don't. So what's so critical about that is that we as the audience are learning information, just general information about his storyline here with his wife that we didn't know, but it's through his eternal optimism and hopefulness. And it's heartbreaking, you know, like we really, oh my God, Ted, it's not okay. <laughs> but maybe it is like we're, 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 we're actively participating in that moment because it's new information on both sides not only his situation with the with his wife in general but we're really seeing ted defined in that moment even in a moment like that he's still going to be his eternally optimistic and hopeful self hugely defining so as we keep going notes and reminders my, we're already coming up on on an hour we'll go a little longer breaking down a show helps you see the patterns from scene to scene and when i mean breaking down a show i mean like an existing show ted lasso it helps you see the patterns, how those writers use both plot and character situations to create a flow and momentum, not only from scene to scene, but how they end each act, problem, conflict, twist, new situation, all within the, the intention to keep the audience on their toes, wanting to see what might happen next. It's important to note that in half-hour comedies, the primary plot storyline, plot situation A, is inherent and assumed in every scene because it's such a big hook, you know? So even though I was referencing plot situation A every now and then in some of those scenes and act breakdowns, I could have easily re removed them and just referenced you know, a focus on other situations. But it's important to note, here's the point of these scenes because in general, the whole show exists because of the main plot situation. You know, in an hour long series, it's, it's easier to bounce from character specific scenes to plot only scenes. Like with, oh, I said with less reference to plot, I meant less reference to character. Um, but it's because of basic reasons of available time, you know, an hour as opposed to a half hour. But even in an hour long series, the primary plot is always hanging over us as we move from scene to scene, even if it's a character only scene, like in Stranger Things, which I break down in um, the craft course, you see them take advantage of some time where you have a scene with reference to only a character situation, meaning there's no plot relation. Ted Lasso, you have every scene pretty much relating to plot in some way, you know, because you have a much shorter amount of time. But as an example, in Stranger Things, you have the teenage girl and the, her crush on the bad boy in high school and they're in her bedroom and they're studying. And he's like helping her study and stuff. We, we have a monster that kidnapped <laughs> a kid and we're able to take some time with these two characters. That's, that's the beauty of an hour long drama because you have that time um, and you're able to spend that time on just the evolution of one character storyline. It's really fun that way. In a half hour comedy, you just don't really have the beauty of that available time. So you have to be creative like that moment where Ted reveals who he is as you know just himself within the situation of that relationship. So I'm saying the most important reminder and I'm throwing this at the end to really screw with you. <laughs> but like I've been saying, due to available space here in this presentation and in general, I had to keep the scene references short, like I said, just to make the point about how the action scenes are structured. But what needs to be done, even before all that stuff I previously showed you, relationships through lines. So in order to properly develop or break a series, you must work through the evolution of all of the relationships in your show. And look how many there are. And I think I'm probably leaving a few out. And this is for Ted, you know, uh, the whole, obviously, Ted Lasso. So you have Ted's relationship with all these other people, how Roy and Keeley work out, Nate and Jamie and those bullies, Rebecca and Higgins, all these people. And you have to see the evolution of all of them. Otherwise, how do you come up with the scene ideas? Like, and, I, and I, again, I'm not trying to be <laughs> condescending, but it's good to just be able to take a step back and go, oh, duh, of course I have to do that. Um, and I think there were a couple other players like Sam is another one of the players who is I love him. He's, he's really he, not a ton of screen time, but there's an evolution of a, of, of, of a storyline there. But like I've been saying, without fully developing all the all of the relationships, we're not going to know all these things. Ongoing plot, continued character evolution, theme and message, which is really important. Uh, future episodes, seasonal arcs, the structure of it all. The above, on which I'm referencing all these storylines, they it has to be done before structure is even considered just to figure out here. I don't know where it's going to land, 
yet. You know, I don't know what episode we're going to throw this in, but I'll guarantee that the writers knew Roy and Keeley were going to end up together, which I, spoiler alert, Ke Jamie and Keeley are at first dating. Keeley ends up with Roy and it's a really sweet little process to see them come together. Um, you know, the full stories of each of these relationships need to, not just development, but they need to be developed. You need to know what they are. What I love so much about Ted Lasso is the expectation from the audience of the, who these characters are. Like when we come into the pilot, all the characters are kind of obvious, almost to a cliche. You know, Jamie is this kind of self-absorbed um, selfie taking soccer star Roy's this you know embattled old veteran who's just kind of pissed off all the time and then you have Keely show up in her Aston Martin she's dressed in the nine she looks amazing you've got Nate who's kind of this nerdy little equipment manager all these characters are you have like pre preconceived notions about them but what the show does is that you see that they're really not those people Rebecca isn't as hardened as she makes herself out to be. And I love the casting choice. Like she looks intimidating. <laughs> She's this tall, beautiful, well-built woman, you know, and, but there are all these other sides and layers to these characters that really twists our expectations. Like Keely is, is, is presented as, you know, this kind of, at first anyway, typical model, materialistic, blah, blah, blah. But pretty quickly we learn that she's not what you would expect in terms of our, you know, in a lot of ways, negative preconceived notions about models, you know, and I don't know how many notions we might have about them, but, but we find that she's really emotionally intelligent. She's a really good friend. She cares about people. She wants to move on with her career and not just do what she's been doing. You know, that we learn all these different things about these characters that are changing our perceived notions about them. I think that's the true brilliance of, of Ted Lasso, this idea of, of hope being instilled within a hopeless situation. And I absolutely guarantee that the writers thought of all of that before they jumped into it. It didn't just kind of oops happen, you know, they brainstormed all these things. So as we keep going with a little summary, that's kind of what I'm just saying, audience's expectation not only of a story's rhythm, but of the show itself. You know, we know, and I'm saying we as in us here, innately, without really thinking about it, how a story is supposed to flow. You know, we've been wired as audience members because we're exposed to story all the time. But if in the second act of a story or in the middle acts of your hour long series or in the second act of a half hour comedy, it, if we're still exposed to too much continued plot and exposition without character reference, the audience is gonna get bored. So you present the plot through character in the first act, but then let us get to know these characters even more so in the second act, third act, et cetera, um, in an hour long, so that we can expect, you know, we, we can participate in, in the process of all of this. We, we can think about how they're gonna deal with the situation going forward. There's a participation process with the audience. So the faster you can allow the, audi allow the audience to just get the plot, here it is, the faster you're gonna be able to hook them when the characters become involved because the characters affect the plot, right? Things get evolved. The plot stays the plot. Ted's always gonna be a coach that doesn't really know what he's doing, but the characters help evolve the layers of everything. So the audience is getting, you know, they naturally care more about the players than the characters than they do the plot. We're gonna tune into a show because the plot is like, oh, that's kind of interesting. We're gonna keep watching because of the characters. So that was a lot. A lot of information. I see a lot of comments popping up. Um, let's see, American optimism versus British cynicism. Huge uh, conscious choice. Like the, what, some of the creators were a little worried about that. I'm like, oh God, how do we get this across? Like there's an actual line in the show where the British say, um, it's the hope that kills you. But look at the character that we're instilling in this situation. The most hopeful person we could meet. You know, he's eternally optimistic and he hates it when people are negative put him into that situation suddenly you've got a ton of possible moments that you can brainstorm um half hour for a detective murder mystery kind of depends um esther where that murder mystery is going to exist like and literally like on what network or streamer i think a lot of british murder mysteries are an hour long i think um but anyway so uh, yeah i mean i think it's either or like i think sherlock was even like an hour and 40 like they made epic long episodes um let's go to a couple of the questions here grace 
Um, good to see you, Grace. I met Grace at Napa, I believe, didn't I? I think I did. Um, can these rules and skills we're discussing here apply if you've made the mistake of writing pages uh, or a whole, whole pilot without a map and now need to rebreak and rewrite an existing piece? The easy answer is totally, of course. Um, it, it, there's, I want to say you can't, well, how do I say this? It's fine if you want to just write a script, you know, like just write it and just so you can feel it. Because it is fun, like the fun part of this is the writing of the scenes, you know. So I'm not trying to tell people you're wrong if you write the pilot first. Go ahead and do that. You have to have the wherewithal and be conscious that this is not going to be the best version of it. And as long as you have that understanding, then you have a healthy approach to the development process. What you want to worry about, though, Grace, is using that pilot as a way to break down the show, like as if this is the right this is the final product and now i'm kind of working back just to check it it's fine to check it right you want to see what the point of each scene is how are the acts breaking um but you want to use it as a development tool so you can grow it you can improve on it you know um otherwise you're just writing one draft and then going back to check it to see if you did it right and then more often than not we might tell ourselves yeah i'm fine <laughs> and then it's like it's not all that helpful um, but uh, would the little scene you didn't include at the end be called a tag? Yeah, or is a tag usually more involved than this? Yeah, I would argue it's a tag. Some real tags or runners, they may have called them years ago, um, is a post credit or, or even during credit sequence. You know, it's like a little wrap up of a D storyline or something. Um, what they have at the very end of the, the pilot episode is just a funny little reference to the fact that Ted never got any sleep. Like there was a running gag throughout the pilot that Ted was always tired because he's got jet lag. And then of course, at the end of the pilot, he's like, of course, great, now I can't sleep. So yeah, you could call that a tag scene, um, but there are so many different definitions in the TV world, you know, and it all depends on the show. Um, the important point to remember is that if you present a pilot in a particular way, that's pretty much how every episode is gonna work. What was fun about the future episodes or the rest of the episodes of the first season is that they instilled this structural um, uh, approach to the beginning of every episode where you have Ted meeting with Rebecca in her office every morning and he calls it biscuits with the boss. Um, and it's just kind of in some episode they're presenting kind of the plot situation of the episode. Here's the situation that that Ted's going to deal with. Um, more often than not, though, it's just a fun little character evolution. You know, you see Rebecca absolutely adores these brownies, but she doesn't want to admit it. Um, she hates to admit that Ted's kind of, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, growing on her. And so we see the process of that, evo the relationship evolve because of the biscuits with the boss. But again, there are times when you can, um, you know, see some plot references in there. Um, let's see. Do you think there's an ideal maximum number of characters or relationships to introduce in the pilot, or does it depend on the show? So the, the lazy answer, Lauren, is it totally depends on the show. Um, what you need to figure out, there isn't a, a magic number, I guess, is, is the, the, easy, the best way of saying that. You really want to work through your show. What is my show? And how many characters do I have? How essential are some of these? Um, you know, if you look at Ted Lasso, there are a lot of characters, but they really only focus on maybe six of them, you know, and Higgins is included in that. So, right, let me see if I can count them offhand. You got Ted, Rebecca, Roy, Jamie, Keeley, Nate, arguably Higgins, and I think I'm missing, I mean, there are a couple of the side characters, like the ex-husband, his new girlfriend, you've got Sam, part of the team, you've got, you know, so you have like 13 characters or something, but six or seven of them are the primary relationship storyline. So those are decisions you're going to want to make too. Uh, do you have advice on switching from writing fiction prose to screenwriting? Um, the quick answer to that would be that um, you have to, I've done it. I, I wrote a screenplay of, well, I wrote a screenplay. <laughs> and then I adapted that, kind of reverse adapted that into a book. Um, I used the script as kind of my first really terrible version of the, of the book. I literally just copied and pasted my script into Word <laughs> and then worked from that. But the biggest lesson I learned is that um, 
a book is still visual. You're still, of course, presenting visuals, but you're talking about them. You're kind of talking about the feeling of the visuals and the feelings of the moments and what this means. And you, know, you spend a page talking about the importance of the of flower, you know, in a script, you just don't have time to do that. And it has to, it has to be visual. The whole point of a screenplay is that you're presenting what's going to be seen on screen. Um, so the, the best thing you can remember when writing a screenplay is that everything that's on the script page is going to be seen on screen. Yes, you can have some little quips every now and then, some kind of funny little you know reference if it's going to be a comedy, but everything that's on the script page is going to be on screen. And so you just want to be careful. Yeah, the screenplays are definitely different in pacing. Uh, the story structure is still generally the same. You have a beginning, middle, and an end. You know, you have setup, misdirector, complication, and a climax or resolution. Every story follows the basic structure. You can just spend a lot more time in a book to get there, um, but you still want to keep readers interesting or interested. You know, after three or four, five, six chapters, whatever the number, there isn't a magic number. Um, you want to get to the setup. You know, what's the big plot situational setup here? You have to get there eventually. Um, screenplays, you just have to do it faster because of just the, the format, you know. Um, can you talk about callbacks briefly that are used so effectively here? Oh man, it's, you know, Sherry, it's a good question. Um, callbacks are kind of like, um, comedians are so good at it. You know, they they see the meaning behind the joke. How can we instill the joke throughout little bits here and there? Um, it's just like a, oh, it's being clever. It's such a lazy answer, um, but it's making a list of jokes. It's working through, you know, how, where might we be able to place that joke um, and then remembering to call back to it. I don't know. There's no magic way of, of, of how to write callbacks, but I think listing your jokes isn't a terrible idea. Uh, do these TV ideas apply when writing a short film? Um, Sure, not as specifically. A short film is much more concept driven. Um, you know, you have a concept for the, the, the short, but then you have a character or two or three, like a relatively small cast that delivers on the concept. It isn't as relationship evolving because you just don't have time. You got 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It's more about the character uh, living within the conceptual approach of the story you know and then maybe there's a resolution maybe there isn't but then there's a reason why there might not be you know are you presenting an idea um are you trying to speak to something politically or culturally or you know there are a lot of different decisions that need to be made up or made um at the outset of why do i want to create or write this short film um shorts are much more of a director's medium um, there's nothing wrong with writing shorts. It's a great practice. I've written a ton of them that I never did anything with just because it was kind of fun. Um, but it's, it's much more conceptually driven, I think would be the best way to, best way to say that. Um, let's see, Jazz, uh, were there any rules broken in Ted Lasso that just worked for this show specifically? It's a good question. I don't really think so. Um, it's hard to say because, you know, I don't know how many rules there really are, <laughs> especially in our, the TV world today, you know, it, it, you, we can pretty much do whatever we want, whatever the story is. Um, I think the, and yeah, see, I wouldn't even say this is rule breaking. It's, it's um, pushing the envelope on the idea of an opponent. You know, there really isn't anybody who's evil in, in Ted Lasso. It's presented that Rebecca might be, but we so quickly understand why she's making these decisions. And it's because her, her uh, husband is a total dick. <laughs> He's a total asshole. I apologize for the language, but he is. He's a, just a horrible person. And so we hate him just as much as she does. So we can understand why she's being quote unquote evil. And she pretty quickly starts regretting the decisions she's made. You know, So everybody is so supportive of each other. The female relationships are really positive. They're helpful. And so nobody's trying to backstab anybody. Um, so I guess you could say there are some rules there might, that might be broken. I just wouldn't call them rules. It's just kind of evolving um, an audience's expectation. You know? 
Um, let's see, anything else? Um, what do we have in the comments? Coach Beard is the perfect silent Bob to Ted's chattery Jay. Yeah, Coach Beard is great. Coach Beard is one of the writers and creators. Um, it was very upsetting to see what became of Giles. Giles. I don't know which one Giles was. I know a Giles from Buffy the Vampire. Oh, Buffy. <laughs> okay. Um, Max, would you give an example of relationship evolution? Okay. So relationship evolution, a really easy example is seeing um, Jamie and Keeley, how they're, how they are when we meet them. Jamie is just kind of, a, he's totally materialistic. He has pictures of Keeley up in his locker of her being, of her nude, you know, um, and she, you can kind of tell that Keely doesn't really like it, but she goes along with it. That relationship evolves through little bits of conflict and things that bother Keely or bother Jamie or she, you know, she, that relationship changes it, and they eventually break up. I mean, that's the general evolution of that change. But we see Keely learning things as to why she should break up with him. And Rebecca has a big part to play there. She, Rebecca mentions, I think in like episode three or four, um, this consideration of accountability. Is Jamie accountable for his aunt, you know, quite, um, actions? And Keely just kind of thinks about that, you know? And then we see the process of that episode move through to the point of Keely saying it's over, you know? So that that's a really obvious evolution um, for, you can look at any of the relationships and Nate, the relationship with Ted and, and um, coach Beard, eventually they hire Nate to be an assistant coach. And yes, that's a plot evolution, but it's because of the friendship that they form. Nate becomes a little bit more confident um, because Ted is giving him chances and Nate's appreciating that. So it, if you look like they're trying not to overthink the idea of relationship evolution, who are they at the beginning? Who are they at the end? What brings them to that end? Whether it's a positive ending or a negative ending. Um, accountability is one of the big themes. Every character wrestles with it. Yeah, there's so many great themes. And that's another thing you have to make lists of. What do I want to say with my show? Why do I want to say it? What's the message? What are the themes? How do I present those themes? It's usually going to be through character and their flaws and, and issues and problems that they have. Because by overcoming some of these problems and flaws, the theme and message is stated because we as an audience connect with the kind of the universal quality of the problems they have. Like we all understand what it's like to go through some form of a breakup, whether it's romantically or otherwise. And Ted's going through a rough one and he has a huge anxiety attack near the middle of the episode, you know? So that's an evolution of his character, even though he doesn't completely change, he's opening up and, and becoming a little bit different than he was, you know, at the beginning of the episode, but not entirely. He's still his eternal optimistic self. But what you also notice is that he gets mad like twice. I think it was only twice. And he was about to just blow up at Jamie. And so, but then Keely came in and interrupted or something. Um, but the point of that, like if you look at from a development project or process, if you have a character who is eternally optimistic and hopeful um, and supportive to it, like a ridiculous point. If he's then given a character to, you know, have some form of a relationship with, this is coach and player, who is so self-absorbed and cares about nothing but himself. He doesn't even like his teammates. He's a jerk. That's going to test the flaw of Ted. And that's a whole other process that I didn't even put in the presentation that there's a reason a character is flawed. It's so that other characters can kind of test and poke at that flaw because that then shows this conflict and, and the fun moments that can come from that, you know? Um, any advice on how to break a story that has two essential leads? Is it even possible to truly have two equal, totally possible? If you look at like a modern family, all those people are leads, <laughs> you know, they're all the main character of their individual storylines, but they're also key players in the overall plot. Ted is, is arguably an equal main character to Rebecca. It's just as much Rebecca's story as it is Ted, you know, Rebecca goes through so many issues. Uh, speaking of the theme of accountability, that moment of genuine forgiveness when Rebecca admits everything to Ted. Yeah. Ted just kind of is like, okay, it was so great. Yeah, there's so many really, really great moments. If you haven't watched the show, I highly, highly recommend it. 
Um, and there's a lot of things you can learn about yourself through it, but it's also just um, a really well done show. Really well done.